Hello and welcome to Pathophysiology of Anemia. My name is David Woodruff. I'm the editor of Critical Care Nursing Made Incredibly Easy. I hope to make this incredibly easy for you too. So let's take a look at what's happening with anemia. When we talk about anemia, we're talking about someone who has a hemoglobin level of less than 12 grams per deciliter. This could be caused by one of three different situations. It could be decreased production of red blood cells. It could be increased destruction of red blood cells, or it could be acute blood loss. Now, I want to differentiate here between hemoglobin and hematocrit. Hemoglobin is an absolute count of our hemoglobin in the blood, whereas hematocrit is a proportion of our red blood cells to blood volume. So hematocrit is going to change with our blood volume. So in other words, if our patient's dehydrated or if our patient is overhydrated, those situations will cause the patient to have changes in hematocrit, whereas hemoglobin should remain relatively stable. So our decreased red blood cell production as one of the three ways that we can end up having anemia. A common way that this occurs is from iron deficiency. And as you can see from the diagram on the right, there is a lot of different manifestations of iron deficiency. However, the one that we're most concerned with right here is going to be the effect it has on the oxygenation in the body by having a low red blood cell count. So where does iron deficiency anemia occur? Well, often in children who aren't taking in enough iron in their diet, adolescents who may be eating um, bizarre foods or whatever, and they're not getting enough iron in their diet. Uh, in, in those cases, both of those children and adolescents are still in growing stages. So they may need an increase, or at least you know, it becomes more uh, important that they are maintaining their iron intake in those areas. Older adults, pregnant women, and in malabsorption syndromes where the patient may not be absorbing the iron even though they're taking it in in their diet. Folic acid and a B12 deficiency. So in those situations, the patient is also uh, not getting these nutrients in their diet. So there's nutritional deficits. This can happen in people who are maybe strict vegetarians, after gastric surgeries where there's not enough absorption occurring in our patients who are alcoholics and uh, malabsorption syndromes, etc. So a lot of, uh, again, nutritional deficits. So when we're looking at iron deficiency, when we're looking at B12 and folic acid deficiency, we're talking about patients who have primarily nutritional deficits. A deficiency can occur in just weeks. So even if you've gone on that strict vegetarian diet for a short period of time, you want to make sure that you're still taking that multivitamin or that you're getting these vitamins and iron in the diet in some other way. Decreased production is another possibility that can lead to anemia. Typically, this is going to happen by a decrease in our erythropoietin production. Erythropoietin is going to be decreased. Well, first of all, let's go to the picture on the right and see that erythropoietin, the stimulus for erythropoietin to be produced, comes from the kidney, and then it stimulates the bone marrow. So erythropoietin itself st stimulates the bone marrow to produce more red blood cells. Of course, we need the iron, the B12, etc., in order to be able to make that production of red blood cells. But then we have an increase in red blood cell production. The underlying stimulus of this whole process will be hypoxia. So if the tissues are recognizing that there is not enough oxygen carrying capability, it increases the amount of erythropoietin that's produced, which then increases our red blood cell production. So if you think about this in terms of some different types of people who may have changes in their erythropoietin production, for example, an athlete. An athlete may have an increased need for oxygen supply to the tissues, which would then stimulate an increase in erythropoietin production, more bone marrow production of red blood cells, and the patient would end up having a higher red blood cell count. So we would anticipate that maybe in some athletes we would see an elevation, or at least on the higher side of normal, of their uh, hemoglobin levels. 
On the opposite end, or another situation, instead of uh, the athlete, we can have somebody who has COPD or another respiratory type of problem where they're chronically in hypoxia. In that situation, again, we're having the stimulation of erythropoietin. The bone marrow is producing more red blood cells, assuming that we have those nutrients. And we could then see an increase in our hemoglobin and hematocrit levels as a result. In those cases, it's both driven by hypoxia that we have this increase in red blood cell production. However, when we take a look at these mechanisms that are involved here, we need to have a healthy kidney, we need to have healthy bone marrow in order to make that happen. So even in a patient who does not have one of those situations, not an athlete, not a COPD, -er, we can still have problems if the patient has a problem with their kidneys or their bone marrow, which would then end up causing a decrease in production. We can also have an increase in destruction of our red blood cells. Hemolytic anemia is one of those type of situations where we start to destroy red blood cells. In sickle cell disease, the patient is going to develop anemia as a result of having some of those red blood cells become sickled cells. Those sickled cells will then be destroyed by the body because they're not functioning like normal red blood cells and they end up blocking some of the peripheral circulation. Autoimmune diseases, splenic disorders, and damage that can occur from some of our external therapies. If we're running blood out of the body through a dialysis machine, a bypass machine, or through an intra-aortic balloon pump, there could be damage to red blood cells as a result of those therapies. Acute blood loss, obviously, would be another way that our patient can end up developing anemia. This could be from trauma. It could be from a surgical blood loss. It could be from a coagulopathy, where the patient is not coagulating the way that they should be, and the patient is having some bleeding, whether that's internal or external. It could be a GI bleed, or it could be a patient who's been anticoagulated and, again, is having some abnormal bleeding occur. So the end result of this is that we're going to have a decrease in our red blood cell production, which then causes the decrease in hemoglobin level. A decrease in hemoglobin will then result in having decreased oxygen carrying capacity, ultimately causing tissue hypoxia. So the compensatory mechanism for tissue hypoxia include tachycardia, tachypnea, decreased capillary refill when we don't have as much red blood cells getting out there to the periphery, potentially orthostatic hypotension. In this case, it may not be volume related. It may be more of a matter of the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood that is getting out to the periphery, specifically in this case, the brain. Hypotension, shock, pallor, restlessness, and of course, fatigue. If you'd like to know more about nursing emergencies, check out our nursing emergencies program where you can decrease complications, rapidly detect problems, and implement prompt action for common nursing problems. Check us out at thenursingprof.com. Well, thank you for joining me for Pathophysiology of Anemia. My name is David Woodruff, and until next time, bye now.